Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the Climate Change and National Security Panel. If you're not here for that panel, this would be a good time to go find a panel you really wanted to be in. You are in probably the most important panel, of course, that we have. And uh, they're streaming it, and they're only streaming two panels, uh, so I figure it must be, must be important. Uh, I'm George Kralovec. I'm a CCL volunteer now for two years. I uh, am also the uh, lead for the Fairfax chapter of Virginia, uh, Virginia District 11. We have a Democrat uh, for a member of Congress, um, Jerry Conley. I'm also uh, the DC coordinator for the Climate and Security Action Team. Formerly, we called it the uh, Climate Change and National Security Group. So if you see that, and that's the same as what we now call the Climate Security Action Team to try to eliminate confusion. The person who really should be standing here today is our team leader for the Climate and Security Action Team, Rod Clifton of Texas. Uh, Rod is a person years before I got into Citizens Climate Lobby who had the vision, initiative, and leadership to work with CCL luminaries that we all know now. Uh, Mark Reynolds and Joe Robertson, Ellie Sparks. I'm sure you've all been impressed by what they've had to show us and uh, what they've had to say so far, if this is your first time with CCL. Well, they worked with Rod to get this group started and uh, it was his vision though, and he built it up. And uh, he registered for this conference to come here despite being quite ill, hoping he could make it. But things turned out that uh, that was not to be, and he's not able to travel. Um, so that's how I ended up up here. I can't fill his shoes, but uh, I can tell you he. He had an ambitious agenda for our team, and serious illnesses prevented his participation. Um, for those of you that know Rod, you know that it would have to be very serious to keep him away. Our climate security and action team table is right outside the door here, and if you've been in CCL for a while, you, you've experienced serendipity, and the only reason it's out there is serendipity. We had to move our tables four times and it was chaos and all our stuff got jumbled together and it just turned out I got here early, earliest this morning and was able to grab the only spot out there so that's why we're not with the other tables. Um, we have a folder there where you can uh, where you can express your appreciation to Rod Clifton for all he's done for Citizens Climate Lobby by starting up this group. Um, I just got a call from him three minutes before we started, and he is watching. It's being streamed from his uh, bedside out in Texas. So would everybody please join me in expressing our appreciation for what Rod's done for CCL. Thank you, Rod. I think you can see. We wish you were here. We miss you. We're grateful for all you've done, and we love you. Uh, while you're out at our table on the way out, um, you can sign up for our new action alert system. It's uh, intended to turbocharge your grassroots lobbying efforts. How will it do that? Um, well, if this works. We want and need you, and hopefully you will want and need us after you see what we can offer to help you turbocharge your grassroots efforts. Um, how would that happen? Well, think about it. 
who, uh, who in, amongst you has a member of Congress or senator that, uh, or a representative that would stand up and say, well, we have people working on national security here, uh, but I'm not really concerned with it. I'm concerned with, with, with our farms and, and a bunch of other issues. Who, who is going to stand up and say that? I don't think anybody in the Congress is going to do that. Um, what American is going to say they're not concerned? What citizen? What, what um, constituent? Uh, number two, uh, look at the rating of the Congress when they take polls. They're lucky to get out of the single digits for uh, respect as an institution today. And then look where the military is rated when they take polls. You, get, you see it up in the 70s and 80s. It's probably the most respected institution in the country. Well, we're dealing with what military leaders are saying here, senior military la leaders. And they've been saying it for over a decade. And they've been saying it uh, with increasing urgency. So those are the things that you'll be leveraging when you need, when something happens that we can hopefully help you find out about that you can cite in your letters to editors, letters directly to your congressmen, representatives and senators, and in all your, all your lobbying efforts. Um, we also have flyers out there on the table you can take that give you an example of uh, what, uh, what that can involve, and it's only the tip of the iceberg. So we're here for the panelists today, and we're really fortunate to have some great panelists. Um, to my right, Lieutenant General John Callsign Glad, Castellaw. He has a call sign because he's an aviator. All aviators get call signs. Sometimes it's the ones they want. Sometimes it's the ones they don't want. We're not going to ask General Castellaw how he got his call sign today. Um, I wouldn't tell you anyway, George. <laughs> <laughs> um, General Castellaw is co-founder and chief executive officer of Farm Space Systems, LLC, a provider of precision agricultural aerial services and equipment. For 36 years, he led Marines around the world while flying more than two dozen different aircraft before returning to the family farm in Tennessee in 2008. There he founded the nonprofit Crockett Policy Institute and created its signature program, Soldier to Civilian, to help veterans find jobs in precision agriculture. I didn't know until this panel there was precision in agriculture. Um, it's interesting when you start looking into it. General Castellaw is, uh, is, is a recognized national security expert who is a member of the Climate Security Working Group Advisory Board. He lectures on national security at the University of Tennessee, Martin, and serves on the Nuclear Security Working Group. That's the bio he submitted. If you noticed, he said he served for 36 years with the Marines around the world flying more than two dozen different aircraft. That's 17 words. I'm not going to allow him to get away with 17 words about his military career. We can't begin to sum up all that he's done in an hour, but I'm going to read a few of the highlights of what he's done. He's led several Marine commands, and as a lieutenant general, that means he's commanded squadrons, air groups, and an air wing. Air wing is 12,000 roughly Marines and over a billion dollars worth of equipment, mostly flying equipment and support equipment. He served with the United Nations during the siege of Sarajevo. He led a U.S. joint force in the multinational security operation in East Timor. Notice a geographical thing here, sort of all over the world. And he was chief of staff for the United States Central Command at the height of the war in Iraq. Imagine that job. In conjunction with his levels of participation, he's met all but, and, and met personally and spoken with uh, all but one of the living presidents today. His last tours on active duty were in the Pentagon, where he was Deputy Commandant of the Marine Corps for Aviation, and then Deputy Commandant for Programs and Resources, both very 
challenging jobs. Please join me to welcome Lieutenant General John Castellaw. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I gotta tell you what uh, George's call sign is, and I don't think you'll be surprised. It's wind. <laughs> I get to uh, try to provide some context for what we're gonna talk about in terms of national security. And how I'd like to do that is sort of take you back a few years and then bring you forward, sort of using some of my experiences to try to set the storyline. And I came in at the end of Vietnam and, and I'm a cold warrior. I spent nearly half of my time as a national security professional getting ready to fight the Soviets. And you know, when I talk to a lot of my European friends especially, they think of the Cold War as a time of the long peace because we had stability, we had a bipolar world. It was us and them. We played by the rules. Vietnam and Korea were aberrations. And then the wall came down. I was in Europe when it came down. And what a feeling of euphoria as we thought peace in our time and that things were gonna be so much better we could pull back on our military expenditures and focus on all those things that we really needed to do. And then things started happening. And this is where I first started seeing what has become what the environment is now. George mentioned I was in Sarajevo. That, even though it wasn't climate generated, it gave me the picture of what happens when food, when water, when the basic elements of human survival are restricted or eliminated. And what it does is it creates a, an environment of chaos where those who have guns, those that have the power rule and the law goes out the window. It's brute power that takes over it's every man and woman for itself, and the civilization breaks down. Then later on, I went to East Timor, and most people have never heard of East Timor. It was a, a uh, Portuguese colony for 300 years, and when the Portuguese dictatorship uh, fell apart, then it was assumed by uh, Indonesia. And again, it was a predominantly Catholic area in a uh, Muslim country and eventually uh, it became independent and then uh, we had militia and others that came in and again created that chaotic situation where only thugs with guns and others uh, were able to rule. And during this time in the 90s and early 2000s, there were some of the most dramatic pieces of technology coming into place. The internet, social media. And so what we saw instead of our major threats being the Soviet Union or some other country attempting to be a peer, we saw the non-state actors being able to use the internet, social media, and even gaming to come together and start seeing the challenge to civilization that we see right now. And so what the military does, and again, you know, our elements of national power, military is just one of them, and unfortunately we default to it way too much because the military contains our most precious national resource, which is the blood of the men and women who serve. But there are other elements of power, economic, diplomatic, cultural, and others. And so, but we, we go too much to the military. And how the military sees climate change. And by the way, you recognize it, 97% of the scientists say so. For us, 70% is good enough to make plans. 
What they see is this is an accelerator or an enabler for the bad guys. When you have chaos, they can operate in it. Many times free of law and order and of people that can oppose them. So that's what you've seen. You know, Syria had five years of historic drought where a million and a half people went into the cities. And you had the conflict already existing between the religious and cultural and ethnic, ethnic people. And so part of what you see now in Syria is because of that drought. Wasn't a primary because they already had a, issues with conflict, but it accelerated that situation. You can look at other places. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Africa, Nigeria. Look at what's happening with the drought and the continued movement of the Sahara, the desertification with the moving of that area and the stress it's putting on the population and the pressure to move into areas. And when that happens, particularly when you've got a lot of population there already, you have the pressures and the conflict intensifies. Not the reason, but it's an accelerator and a threat multiplier. Another area that uh, is getting a lot of play and you know, a lot of an stuff in news is about the Arctic. You know, that Russia has 40 icebreakers. 40, some of them are nuclear powered. Estonia has two, and the United States has two. But we're starting to see movement into that area and the potential exists for conflict because of our competing interest in it. Again, Russia and us, already have the elements for conflict, the Arctic opening up due to cl climate change accelerates and makes the potential for conflict between us uh, even greater. Also, you know, it was mentioned that, that, that I'm involved in, in agriculture, uh, and there's a couple of real good reasons why. The rural population of this nation is 16% dropping, 16%. The military is made up from that 16%, 40% of the military from that 16%. And so we in the rural areas, particularly the agriculture, has you know, a very personal concern with putting our folks in harm's way. And another reason is about food security. We're gonna to have to feed two billion more people by 2050. Two billion, and it's not just the number of mouths, it's the fact that they wanna eat better. And so that's gonna put additional pressure on it. And when we see the intensification of storms, and, and I am a fervent reader of a, a very radical publication called Progressive Farmer. <laughs> it's been in existence for 125 years. And in those pages, it talks about the need to have seeds that are not only drought resistant, but moisture resistant due to too much rain. We need additional conservation means because the storms are getting more intensive. And so agriculture is another one of those elements of our national security that we need to pay attention to, that we need to do a better job of sustaining our agriculture. We need to do a better job of taking care of our environment, and we need to do a better job of planning for the future. I'm gonna quit now so that Roger can get up and, and talk. He's a much smarter guy than I am, but I'm gonna give you sort of a lead in to what he's talking about. And one of these elements is, is uh, energy usage and the fact that we pull so much uh, carbon-based uh, uh, fuels. 
You know, I, I grew up in the military as an aviator, and the only time that I thought I ever had too much gas was when I was on fire. <laughs> and so we have had to change our culture to be more careful and more thoughtful of, about how we use it. But it really only, in my old age, came to me. I was standing on a dam, Haditha Dam in western Iraq, and I was looking down the valley there, the Euphrates, and it was like a biblical scene on the wall of my Southern Baptist Church back in Tennessee with the river flowing down through there and the green all the way around it. And I saw a convoy of Marines coming in and their Humvees and other trucks, and all of a sudden, one of the biggest explosions I've ever seen goes off, an improvised explosive device, an IED. Those convoys, seven out of 10, were carrying gas and water. And so the military knows that we, in order to reduce the vulnerability of those who serve that precious blood, that we've got to do a better job of using those resources. Thanks very much for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to hearing from the most important people here today, which is you, when we have the questions. Thank you very much. So I ask you, can you imagine anything more powerful than having somebody like General Castellar come speak to your member of Congress and some of his colleagues uh, about the importance for our national security of doing something about climate change? The action team can help you with that if you'd like to get a speaker or somebody to ask them to have a hearing or, uh, or briefing from. I'm sorry to do that to you, General. I expected it when. <laughs> <laughs> Our next distinguished panelist we're lucky to have today is Mr. Roger Sorkin. Roger is an award-winning producer, writer, and director specializing in the nexus between environment, energy, and national security. His production company, Sorkin Strategic Communications, has created films for a variety of NGO, government, and nonprofit clients since 2002. His latest independent film, The Burden, has been called the most effective communications tool ever made for shifting the debate on clean energy as one of urgent national security. I was privileged to be at the world premiere for The Burden. I can tell you it deserves every one of the awards it has won, and it ought to be mandatory viewing for every member of Congress. Roger is an alumnus of the U.S. Army War College National Security Seminar and a fellow with the Truman National Security Project, where he also serves as a spokesperson for their Operation Free campaign. He has served as a communications advisor to the NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence and as a delegate to the Electricity Infrastructure Security Council. Roger began his career in broadcasting as the founding producer of a daily public affairs program in 1993. Doesn't look old enough to me. And then received a Master of Communication from Stanford University with a focus in documentary film before moving to Washington, D.C., where he worked as a freelance writer, producer, and editor of a variety of documentary productions before starting his own company. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Roger Sorkin. Thank you, George, and uh, thank you all. It's uh, certainly an honor to be here with this distinguished group. Um, so General Castella started uh, by talking about climate change as a national security threat, and there was a phrase that he mentioned that was the singular phrase that grabbed my attention on this when I first became interested in the issue, and that is threat multiplier. Um, I'm in the business of telling stories, and I think that there's no better phrase for telling the story of climate change as a national security threat than those two words. Um, you don't have to have military experience to know what that means. Um, and so really the way that I came in, became, uh, became interested in this subject is I saw a movie called Inconvenient Truth. Um, I mean, I cared about climate change, but I, I thought that this movie, Inconvenient Truth, was going to be the game changer. And arguably it was in some ways. Um, 
I don't mean to be too much of a cynic. I mean, I think it probably motivated a lot of people to take some sort of action. Um, but I think that simply because of the messenger, uh, and I don't mean at all to disparage Vice President Gore uh, with all due respect uh, for the great work that he has done on these issues, for whatever reasons, he, there is still a large portion of this country that don't, doesn't care what he says because of who he is. And that's not his fault, uh, that's politics. Um, and so it occurred to me that the messenger matters. Uh, and that's why General Castillo is on this panel. Um, the only reason I'm on this panel is because I make films with people like General Castillo in them. Um, and I think that's, as you all go up to the Hill tomorrow and you do your continued communications outreach to convince your members of Congress and anybody else, and I would say it also, I know the focus is on Congress tomorrow, but the private sector matters. Um, and I think that's our bridge perhaps to conservative political thought and action, uh, and not in any sort of pandering way. I mean, you know, if you're liberal and progressive, be proud of it, own it, it's, your, it's who you are. Don't pretend to be a conservative if you're not. But I think that there are conservative values that are also American values, just like there are progressive values that are also American values. And it's our job to find the common ground among those values. Um, nobody in this country except for sociopaths, will say that they're against saving American lives and money. And I think that's where we unite across the political spectrum. Um, and I think that's when you go in there tomorrow and you're talking to your members, you have to think about the frame. You have to think about the messenger. Um, you know, to go in there and lead with, and I know you all have lots of training on this, and you've, you've, your trainers have done their due diligence, uh, but you're not going to go into James Inhofe's office and say, you know, I'm here because I'm really worried about polar bears. Um, it's not going to work. Um, so you've got to think of what is the frame to present these facts within. And speaking of facts, I think stories are not only vehicles for facts, but vehicles for emotional and human connection. And that's what I think the power of story is. I'm sort of an evangelist for the power of story, because that's what I do for a living. Um, but I think that a story well told goes for your heartstrings. Um, facts can get lost. They can stick with you if they're presented in the right kind of way, but our brains can only process so much factual information, and to present it in, in, in emotional terms, that's, that's what the vehicle of a story allows us to do. Um, and so I would encourage you, when you talk about this, to talk about it in terms of the, our fellow citizens who serve our country because of our energy habit. I mean, you may not even bring up climate change with James Inhofe, but you might talk about our energy problems because if we can solve our energy problems, it's a, we're, we're pretty close to solving our climate problems if we can solve our energy problems. I mean, there are a lot of other factors in there, but uh, that's probably the big one. Um, and so the way the military talks about energy is in terms of operational security. As the general mentioned, we have fuel convoys that whether we're in a hot war or not, we're still transporting lots of fuel around the world all the time. It might just be to keep the the uh, shipping lanes free of piracy, for example. We still, still need a lot of fuel to do it. Um, and so being beholden to this global oil economy is a direct threat to our, our national security. And so I, I'd like to show you the trailer for The Burden to give you a sense of how the story is told. Um, and then when we come back, I'll just uh, talk briefly about my new project, which is called the Tidewater Security Project. That's a series of films. Again, not focusing so much on the phrase climate change, but talking about resilience, mitigation, and adaptation to environmental challenges that we have. Um, there's no need to bring up climate in that sentence because everybody gets it. You know, the ocean is there. Whether you care about the causes or not, it's rising. Um, our military installations are threatened. And so I think that's, that's the frame that a lot of conservatives who care about national security and, frankly, economic prosperity are going to, uh, it's going to resonate with them in that context. So, so let's see the burden and then uh, we'll come back and see Tidewater. I went to West Point. I studied a lot of highly skilled, advanced training. And when we got to Iraq, I was appalled at how little of it we actually employ. 
and just how much time was wasted on getting and protecting fuel. We spend a lot of resources just moving fuel throughout the battlefield. Everything they do relies on fuel. The overdependence on fuels is affecting our environment. The burden on the military will increase as they're forced to respond because they are the best first responders in the world. One of the reasons why we're in the Persian Gulf is to maintain the stability of oil. Every time the price goes up so sharply, it does economic damage. Oil we use puts money in the hands of some countries that are problems for us. The consumption of oil is a national security issue. Heat, lights, vehicles going out, fuel the light blood, and without fuel, these guys be sitting ducks. In the next 10 years, the Air Force Academy plans to generate all of their own electricity through renewable sources. There's a huge potential for the armed forces to be an innovation pull in energy. Americans by nature, it's in our DNA to look for the next frontier. We can prevent future generations from having to be deployed for fossil fuel. Using these technologies is providing great value to the taxpayers. How much more powerful would it be if we had sources of energy that weren't geographically dependent? We'd break free of oil. We'd say to the Middle East, see if you can drink that stuff. If we applied it in energy, we win the triple play of this American century. We improve the national security, create jobs, and we clean up the air. It's not a cost. It's an investment. So, so um, that's theburdenfilm.com. You can look at that and the, all those little factoids that you see there, you can rattle those off tomorrow. Um, you know, this is just about our national security and, and that's, I think, the, a really safe frame to, to put this into. Um, I just want to say a word about doom and gloom which I am frankly tired of, I think all of you might be as well, especially in media. I mean, I think that the, uh, there are so many films uh, and news stories about the terrible problems, the terrible outcomes that we will encounter as a result of climate change. And as a, uh, a strategist to the Joint Chiefs of Staff told me when I interviewed him for this film, he said to me, stay away from the doom and gloom uh, because fear, in his words, is a contractive medium. <laughs> So he was speaking as a behavioral scientist, and you know, he, I think, had five master's degrees in behavioral science as one of them. Um, but it's, it's pure math. If you scare people, they contract. If you inspire them, they collaborate. I mean, it's, it's just a basic formula. Uh, so the more we can present, there is opportunity here, um, and that there is a capability here, um, then I think you, there, there will be more action taken. And so. Um, so we can get to the discussion. I'll, I'll just show you the follow-up piece to this, which is called the Tidewater Security Project. It's, again, through the lens of national security and economic opportunity, is focusing on resilience, mitigation, and, and adaptation um, in the, the, the name of national security and economic opportunity. Again, I don't really talk about climate change. Um, I'm focusing first on the naval base in Norfolk, Virginia, Hampton Roads region. It's our largest base. Uh, we also have a lot of other military installations down there. It's a major deployment po point for U.S. forces, um, not just for battle, but for humanitarian efforts, where we then get called to help address the, the uh, disaster relief that occurs from some more uh, increased storms, uh, more severe weather events as a result of climate change. Um, and so the spirit of this effort is to try to use film as a strategic tool to influence smart policy in this area. So in consulting with advocacy partners, starting there, finding out what's the, what is the policy that we need, and then you work your way backwards and figure out, okay, what's the film that we need to tell that story to get us there? So um, we'll see the trailer for the Tidewater Security Project, and then I'll turn it back to George for discussion. whether folks want to call it sea level rise, whether they want to call it climate change, whatever the cause, our waters are rising. If we can't have a discussion on climate change, 
And can we have a discussion on infrastructure resiliency? People understand on the coast that these things are happening. They know flooding's happening more often. When the power goes out, that threatens the water system, that threatens the communication system. That then has some significant public health and business impacts. The community provides us utilities, electrical power, water, sewage, the transportation infrastructure that we need. We count on the community. Pretty difficult to get the people onto the base if they're driving down roads that have standing water on them. All that has an impact on our ability to go do whatever that mission is. There's no aspect of life that's not going to be touched. Every unit of government ought to be concerned and be engaged. They all have a piece of the action. It forces this idea of regional collaboration on us. This isn't just a government thing. This is something that's impacting the entire community. Friends and family, people that we go to church with, people that we hang out with. That sailor is also a Sunday school teacher. That sailor is also a little league coach. The solving of this problem is going to take the integration of government and the private sector and the nonprofit sector all working together. We need to be more resilient. How do we make our bases and the communities more resilient or more adaptive? Two issues that people care about the most their families and their homes. It doesn't matter what political party you're with. The Tidewater Security Project is showing that this is a national, not a party issue. This is about our state of national security. How do our coastal communities adapt? No mission is too difficult and no sacrifice too great because he who fails to plan plans to fail and failure is not an option. Say briefly, if anybody wants to do screenings in your communities, please come talk to me afterwards. I think we can see from, from those uh, clips that uh, there's very powerful messages that Roger is, stories that he's telling. And uh, from watching the entire 40 minutes of the burden, I can, I can vouch for that and I'm sure we're going to see the same thing with the Tidewater project that he's doing, and that's going to be a series of films. Um, I have cards coming in with questions. I'm going to take moderator's privilege and ask uh, the first question of each, each of our panel members. We've got about 20 minutes left. Um, General Castellaw, I'm going to start with you, and, and you gave us a powerful story about about what happens when communities are faced with uh, the inability to get food, water, uh, even if it isn't caused by climate change, but we know climate change is, is going to cause that. Um, could you share any lessons you have uh, with working with people in rural areas, for those of us here that are doing that? I, I'm not, I'm here in Northern Virginia, I'm from Chicago, I don't speak rural. Um, so, but we have people here, and we get some of our best support from our chapters out in rural areas. Can you help us with both your business experience and your lessons as a farmer with what we can, how we can best approach and tell this story for uh, people in rural areas? Sure, George, I'd love to. You know, uh, <clears throat> the heartland has been such a a base uh, for people that have played such key roles in our nation's history, and they still are. I think uh, most of us see the rural population as conservative, as practical, as no nonsense, that like to have the information straight, unfiltered, and across the board. And that's how I find working with my fellow ruralites. Uh, be upfront with them, tell them what the issues are, and they're seeing it. Uh, you know, the crop 
days, the growing season, has increased by 10 days in the last couple of decades. 10 days. You know, back where we are, you know, we never had armadillos or something that those Texicans had to deal with. <laughs> but now you can see the results. And people living there see that. They understand that. I talked about uh, seeds and how we're racing to develop. All of that provides empir empirical data of, of what's going on. So you start with that. And like Roger said, you stay away from some radioactive we uh, words uh, like global warming, Al Gore, and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. And just talk about what they're actually. The first thing you got to do is to have them acknowledge, and they will when you approach it in this manner, uh, that, that we have a problem. And then from there, we can go to fix it. Okay, I have so many good questions here, we're going to have to take the next period too and have them go someplace else. Uh, obviously, we won't be able to do that. Uh, for Mr. Sorkin, when and how will the Tidewater Security Project be available for purchase to view with our member of contract Congress offices? Hopefully very soon. Um, it's recently been started. Um, it's an interesting sort of hybrid organization where it's not just a film, um, but essentially it's, it's the creation of an advocacy organization that creates films to advance policy and behavioral change. Um, right now, we have a number of partner organizations that are advising us on policy, including the Center for Climate and Security. Uh, it's recently uh, become our fiscal sponsor. Uh, General Castell is also uh, on the board. Um, no relation to this conversation. There was no <laughs> quid pro quo uh, or anything like that. Um, but a Union of Concerned Scientists is also advising us, as is, uh, as always, the Great Truman National Security Project, which was um, uh, the organization that helped produce the burden. Um, so what we hope to do is create films that have those advocacy goals in mind. And as we see and identify one, we'll make a film about it. And the film will keep its eye on the goal of getting that policy through. So just to give you a very quick example, with the burden, there was a, uh, a number of bills that, that uh, we tried to use the film in very strategic settings to advance, like SB 350 in California, which dramatically cuts the state's use of, of oil, um, as well as renewal of the federal uh, solar investment tax credit. Organizations use the film to even just small screenings sometimes to get before their members of Congress or other leaders, perhaps in the private sector. Uh, so Tidewater will be available uh, as soon as we can raise the money that we need. If anyone wants to talk to me about how you can help support that, please come talk to me offline. Um, but uh, we're hoping that our first film, specifically on the Hampton Roads region, is going to be released uh, in the fall. I have uh, a couple here that are immediate actions <laughs> for tomorrow, so I'm going to shift to that and back to General Castellaw. What advice do you have for our meeting tomorrow with uh, Representative Mac Thornburg, Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee? Me? Yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I've had the opportunity to to go over on a hill with uh, folks like American Security Project, uh, uh, with the Climate Security Working Group, and with other organizations. Uh, the best way, and Roger's already cited it, the best way to engage Mr. Thornberry or anybody is with your personal story. Uh, why it's important to you. That's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear talking points from Truman Project or ASP or, or others like that. They want to know what you think, why you think it, why you think it's important, and what, what, they, what you want them to do. And I think that's the most effective way to go about it. Okay, the next uh, question is for Roger. Uh, I think either of our panelists could address this at length, but um, because of his Tidewater project, I'm going to 
let Roger have the first crack at it. Will it be costly to protect coastal military facilities from sea level rise? Yes, and it will be more costly to not protect them from sea level rise. Um, that's really it in a nutshell. Do you want to pay now or do you want to pay more later? And that translates to political will, which we've talked quite a bit about today. I might follow up on that just for a second. Uh, you know, we're talking about how, how you engage folks and everything. I'm also uh, a part of a um, military business and faith community. Uh, one of the strongest voices, emerging voices, in the climate uh, uh, subject issue is the faith community, uh, where they realize that this is God's earth, that we're put here to be good stewards of it, and it's our responsibility to take care of it. And uh, those are becoming uh, powerful voices, uh, particularly with uh, conservatives on uh, putting the message forward. I have another question about a meeting tomorrow, um, but I think it's already been, been answered. This is about a meeting with the uh, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunes. Uh, I live in his district and we'll be meeting with him tomorrow. What should I say to him? I don't know, General Kastelhoff, that would change much from what you already advised. Uh, I don't have much to say about intelligence. So, that's right. <laughs> uh, just a quick point on that. I mean, this speaks to the idea of knowing your audience, and if you you know, and it's, there's, a, there's a line between knowing your audience and pandering. Um, if you know what this congressman cares about, and you you and you share some of those same cares, then that's a great conversation starter. Um, you know, certainly with regards to intelligence, uh, you know, you can you can connect the dots. I mean, I believe. I can't confirm it because they wouldn't confirm it for me, but I've, I've been told that the CIA does climate intelligence and they are concerned that if an aquifer is drying up in a particular region of the world, what is that going to do to the local politics on the ground and by extension, how might that develop into conflict? Uh, so I think it's, it's pretty easy to connect the dots between uh, intelligence uh, with regards to uh, climate security. Roger simulated my thought buds there. One of the things that's happening that impacts, believe it or not, uh, particularly the Western United States, is the fact that the uh, aquifers in Saudi Arabia are drying up. Uh, people, I think, haven't realized, and they're starting to, because what you're seeing is a lot of buying up of Western farmland uh, the Saudis had embarked on a very aggressive program to raise alfalfa and other feeds uh, for dairy farms that they had established there. And they're running out of water and they've got to shut down, but they still want to have the capability. So you're starting to see alfalfa produced in Arizona and Colorado and Nevada and some of these other places that are then put on ships and sent to Saudi Arabia. And that has, they're gonna become very dependent on that source to provide food for the dairy cows, for milk. So you can see how uh, uh, geostrategic that that element of agriculture is gonna become. In that regard, the Climate Action Team has uh, a study recently by MIT uh, and others that shows uh, under current projections, if, if under the do-nothing scenario, the entire Middle East and Northern Africa will become uninhabitable for humans by the end of the century. Um, think about the current refugee crisis and think about that. Um, this is one my brother-in-law always asked me, and I'm going to punish both our panelists with this one. But they might have some ideas, because I think my brother-in-law has a point, even though he's a nephrologist and doesn't know much about climate change. Um, 
could you please talk with Rush Limbaugh <laughs> and other pro-military media people about the military um, only needing a 70% assurance to start taking action and how our coastal military bases are threatened. Do either one of you have any thoughts or have you ever thought about how we could influence that part of the radio talk show media? My uh, strongest recommendation on uh, engaging Rush Limbaugh is to turn the radio off. <laughs> <laughs> There are some efforts that are just not worth it, and that's one of them. <laughs> Roger may have a different view, but that's right. I just say throw the radio uh, in front of an oncoming train after you turn it off. Um, actually, Kia, Kia from uh, Climate Action Network mentioned it this morning. You're, you're never going to get the whole country, and if you can get a, an activist core, then that's all you need. Um, forget Rush Limbaugh. You're never going to win over Rush Limbaugh. Um, but, but there again, I mean, if you're talking to somebody, you know, you sit next to someone on a plane and, you know, you got a Rush Limbaugh hat or something. I mean, there's a way into that conversation. And you don't lead by saying, I have no respect for you because you're wearing that hat, which is probably what you're feeling. Um, <laughs> but you might talk about, well, what, what is making this person tick? You know, you've got to try to get inside their, their value set. Um, what are their values? And what are the values that maybe we share? Uh, again. Do you care about saving American lives? Do you care about saving our money? Um, that's always a way to get into the, the conversation. And the facts are definitely on your side in that one. OK. Um, one for General Castellaw. Will the US have to deploy more military resources to the Arctic because of Arctic melting and Russian influence in that region? Well, the, the, the answer is yes, and we're already uh, making plans to do that. Uh, uh, as uh, I mentioned briefly before, uh, the uh, Russians have uh, reactivated their Arctic command. They're uh, aggressively and frequently conducting exercises in that area. Uh, I've already talked about the 40 uh, icebreakers that they have. They just commissioned the largest icebreaker in the world that's nuclear powered. Um, they are going to ensure they have natural gas resources and a shipping term, terminal up in, uh, in the Arctic area. They, they're going to do everything they can to ensure uh, that they can ship uh, that uh, uh, gas out of those terminals and they can break the ice. It's already uh, much less uh, than the historical average has been. Uh, and so we, being the, the rest of the world, uh, the Canadians, uh, us, uh, even the Chinese, uh, are looking at how they're going to inject more forces and more capability uh, into the Arctic. And the U.S. must do that, and we're already in the process of planning for it. Uh, we have forces in, in Alaska now, uh, both uh, air and uh, uh, ground forces, and, and I think that, uh, that we're going to see more movement, uh, particularly by uh, naval forces, into that area as, uh, as time continues. I'm going to have another question for General Castellaw because we have more agricultural related questions here, uh, and uh, I want to hit at least a couple of them. Um, UN Year of the Soil, a couple of years ago, estimated that there are only 100 growing seasons left under present agricultural practices. Uh, this is after we've had 6,000 growing seasons under current practices. What are we to do? And is, I would add, is climate change going to, uh, or is it causing part of what's causing that? Um, do you see it make, you know, creating a, a situation where this is even even worse. What do you hear from your farmers, your customers? Well, again, I'm not familiar with that particular statistic. Uh, I can only uh, talk about what I know. Uh, we've had two great waves of where we've uh, had 
advances in agriculture that has allowed us uh, to feed uh, the world's population. Uh, we're in a process now of seeing the third wave. And that third wave is based on what's called precision agriculture. It's the Goldilocks principle, only the right amount of the right stuff at the right place at the right time. What that does is reduce the amount of chemicals, the amount of fertilizer, the amount of stuff, inputs in uh, agricultural parlance that you put into the soil. That reduces for the farmer, which is practical and the weight of his heart, the production cost, and for the rest of it, of us, what it does is reduce the amount of runoff that goes into the streams, that goes into the lakes, that go in, goes into the oceans. I think, my view, is that we are seeing the adoption of that because it's the right thing to do from an economic perspective, it's the right thing to do from an environmental perspective, it's a win-win all around. And I'm just getting the cut out there. Well, I show two minutes left. Why, was there a two-minute warning? <laughs> One more question. <laughs> what, and, um, what to you are the most eye-opening quotes or facts about the national security impacts of climate change for us to use with Republican members of Congress tomorrow? I could tell you if, if you we had access to the database we have up with, for the action team, we've got, got thousands of, of pages of cries for help and studies by senior military uh, boards, the Center for Naval Analysis, the RAND Corporation, eye-opening facts. Are there any top, top ones that come to the top of your mind here in the minute we have left? I would probably Google the website that you're talking about in order to get that. Um, I mean, with regards to just clean energy, I would say, you know, the, the most salient facts are in the trailer to the burden, um, which you can, you can look at again, uh, burden film, theburdenfilm.com. Um, but uh, I think, uh, you know, CCL has probably got all that stuff right there for you. I mean, I, that's, that would be my go-to source. Okay. All right, I think we're out of time. Would you please uh, join me in uh, expression of appreciation for our panelists?